His main trait was his passion for tantalisation. Goodness, what a tease the poor fellow was. He challenged my scholarship. I am sufficiently proud of my knowing something to be modest about my not knowing all, and I dare say I missed some elements of that cryptogrammic paper chase. What a shiver of triumph and loathing shook my frail frame when, among the plain innocent names in the hotel recorder, his fiendish conundrum would ejaculate in my face. I noticed that whenever he felt his enigmas were becoming too recondite, even for such a solver as I, he would lure me back with an easy one. Arsène Lupin was obvious to a Frenchman who remembered the detective stories of his youth, and one hardly had to be a Coleridgean to appreciate the trite poke of a person, Porlock, England. In horrible taste, but basically suggestive of a cultured man, not a policeman, not a common goon, not a lewd salesman, were such assumed names as Arthur Rainbow, plainly the travestied author of Le Bateau Bleu. Let me laugh a little too, gentlemen. And Maurice Schmetterling, of Loiseau Ivre fame. Touché, reader. The silly but funny D. Organ, Elmira, New York, was from Moliere, of course, and because I had quite recently tried to interest Lolita in a famous 18th-century play, I welcomed as an old friend Harry Bumper, Sheridan, Wyoming. An ordinary encyclopedia informed me who the peculiar-looking Phineas Quimby, Lebanon, New Hampshire, was, and any good Freudian with a German name and some interest in religious prostitution should recognise at a glance the implication of Dr Kitzler, Eric's miss. So far, so good. That sort of fun was shoddy, but on the whole impersonal and thus innocuous. Among entries that arrested my attention as undoubtable clues per se, but baffled me in respect of their finer points, I do not care to mention many, since I feel I am groping in a borderland mist with verbal phantoms turning perhaps into living vacationists. Who was Johnny Randall, Ramble, Ohio? Or was he a real person who just happened to write a hand similar to N.S. Aristoff, Catagala, New York? What was the sting in Catagala? And what about James Maver Morell, Hoaxton, England? Aristophanes, hoax, fine, but what was I missing? There was one strain running through all that pseudonymity which caused me especially painful palpitations when I came across it. Such things as G-Trap, Geneva, New York, was the sign of treachery on Lolita's part. Aubrey Beardsley, Calcapart Island, suggested more lucidly than the garbled telephone message had that the starting point of the affair should be looked for in the East. Lucas Picador Merime Parr insinuated that my Carmen had betrayed my pathetic endearments to the impostor. Horribly cruel, forsooth, was Will Brown Dolores Collo. The gruesome Harold Hayes Tombstone, Arizona, which at another time would have appealed to my sense of humour, implied a familiarity with the girl's past that in nightmare fashion suggested for a moment that my quarry was an old friend of the family, maybe an old flame of Charlotte's, maybe a redresser of wrongs, Donald Quick's Sierra Nevada. But the most penetrating bodkin was the anagram-tailed entry in the register of Chestnut Lodge, Ted Hunter, Kane, New Hampshire. The garbled licence numbers left by all these persons and organs and morels and traps only told me that the motel keepers omit to check if guests' cars are accurately listed. References incompletely or incorrectly indicated to the cars the fiend had hired for short laps between Waste and Elphinstone were, of course, useless. The licence of the initial Aztec was a shimmer of shifting numerals, some transposed, others altered or omitted, but somehow forming interrelated combinations, such as WS1564 and SH1616 and Q328888 or... CU 88322, which, however, was so cunningly contrived as to never reveal a common denominator. It occurred to me that after he had turned that convertible over to accomplices in waste and switched to the stage motor car system, his successors might have been less careful and might have inscribed at some hotel office the archetype of those interrelated figures. But if looking for the fiend along a road I knew he had taken was such a complicated, vague and unprofitable business... What could I expect from any attempt to trace unknown motorists travelling along unknown routes? By the time I reached Beardsley, in the course of the harrowing recapitulation I have now discussed at sufficient length, a complete image had formed in my mind, and through the, always risky, process of elimination, I had reduced this image to the only concrete source that morbid cerebration and torpid memory could give it. Except for the Reverend Rigor Mortis, as the girls called him, and an old gentleman who taught non-obligatory German and Latin, there were no regular male teachers at Beardsley School. 
but on two occasions an art instructor on the Beardsley College faculty had come over to show the schoolgirls magic lantern pictures of French castles and 19th century paintings. I had wanted to attend those projections and talks, but Dolly, as was her wont, had asked me not to, period. I also remembered that Gaston had referred to that particular lecturer as a brilliant garçon, but that was all. Memory refused to supply me with the name of the chateau lover.